here we are. And um, I've got an absolute treat for you uh, today. And I'm so pleased that uh, you're joining us. And um, I'm going to introduce to you our special guest. Well, actually, our special guest in, in usual Blackxit tradition is going to introduce himself, because that's how we do here on Blackxit. So please, uh, Dr. Kavon. So my name is uh, Okunini Obadele Bakari Kamba. Uh, Okunini is a title in P. They usually translate that as doctor. It's actually a military, a war title in uh, past times. Um, and I prefer that to doctor itself. Um, I'm also Nanakwami Pebidati Aldikai Bamuchi Domhene, and this is the warrior title uh, from when I became installed at Ekwapia Mampong, uh, a place about 40 minutes drive outside of Accra, which is also where I'm building and I have land. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm the founder of Abibitumi, and Abibitumi is uh, from the tree language, it translates to black power, Abibitumi, and that's what the site and the app and everything is about. Um, we have thousands of, thousands of members, uh, hundreds of thousands of posts uh, made there in the forum and then news feed and everything else. Um, and what that is, is a modality where black people can contact other black people without uh, interference from non-blacks. So usually, you know, people are complaining that they got put in um, you know, white book jail or, you know, litter <laughs> or all these different things. So, you know, it just brings up to the point that we have to... So tell us more about the platform quickly so we can obviously promote it as you're just mentioning it now. Because I, I, you said you're the founder of it. So just tell people how they can... Um, actually get into um uh, and how they can join because i think that's really important because we need a safe space <laughs> yeah to that uh, exact same point that's why we uh, created a bb2me.tv and a bb2me.tv.com and i'll spell those a b i b i t u m i now back in march we had a, a situation where um you know because I have like uh, just short of 10,000 uh, subscribers on YouTube, that um, you know, anytime that I would do an event or whatever, I put it there, then you know, we get thousands and thousands of views, thousands of followers, and so forth. So we had one event in particular where there was a guy who was there, um, and we were discussing concerning violence, which was a documentary about Anana France Fanon's uh, book, Wretched of the Earth. And, um, you know, the guy was there and we start discussing page 39 of the book where it says the uh, colonized man is envious and he wants the colonizer's house and the colonizer's bed, uh, hopefully with the colonizer's woman in the bed. He said, you're talking about me, you're talking about me. I was like, what are you talking about? So he's there, he has a white wife. So he's taking this like personally. Oh. And everybody's like, okay, you can't take this person. We're actually discussing what's in the film. But uh, lo and behold, the powers that be here where I work, they were like, yeah, 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 that's, that's talking about him. You can't discuss that, you know, basically in his presence. So it was a whole big debacle. And then from that, you know, one of them reported a video, reported that video, and um, it became this thing of, okay, they reported it, and it was a copyright strike and another copyright strike, and just all this stuff. So I was like, you know what? as long as we're on these non-black control platforms, you can have these, uh, you know, they like to say they're pan-Africanists, they're really pan-Africanists, more than half, 50% tops. And, um, you know, so we were like, you know, we have to have our own platform. So we had already started off with it before this uh, situation uh, occurred, but we decided, yeah, we really have to promote this. So from March, I stopped posting on YouTube and I post exclusively now to uh, bb2me.tv and uh, bb2me.tv.com. So, you know, it's, um, you know, there are so many people who are on these white platforms and their messages, yeah, we have to have our own and they're sitting on white platforms. So I was like, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> But don't, don't worry, I'm jumping onto your platform, yeah? I'm going to straddle, yeah? Word to the I'm wise. straddling. To the wise. I hear you. So, you know, this was a thing, and then there was another group that had a similar situation, Black Integrity TV, where, um, you know, their videos were being pulled down and reported because they're, you know, too African, too Black, whatever, too strong. 
So they were like, you know, we have to have our own, and this was a platform, so they've been posting very heavily. Now, even before all of this, there was another situation where I was on Class FM, which is a, a radio station here. And again, I recorded, posted it up to uh, my channel. And uh, as soon as it went up, like within 30 minutes, I started seeing videos disappear before my very eyes. So I have like a good 600 some videos. And I'm like, you know, what's going on? I see an email that says your account has been terminated. Now the interview was about uh, Donald Trump and United States politics. So it was like a legit interview, but I guess maybe the algorithm or whatever, it flagged the thing and they literally just terminated my account like that, no questions asked. So I had to go through this form and another form and whatever. Now on a whim, they decided, oh yeah, that doesn't violate our terms. Okay, we're gonna restore. So now the videos that just disappeared in front of my eyes, they start repopulating onto the channel, so forth and so on. But this was something that was you know, blocking access to everything owned by Drupal. So if there's this account, that account associated with it, everything got wiped out in one fell swoop. And I just got the email because I had a backup email that it notified about the situation. So, you know, there are only so many times that you need to get that same message <laughs> over and over again, that as long as non-applicants control our means of connecting with each other, then just on a whim, just like that, they can decide, you don't want you to connect with other black people anymore. And then, you know, there you go. So, you know, we have to have our own systems, our own structures, our own infrastructure, and that's what this is all about. Now, the main site, yeah. the oldest site, and that's abibitumi.com, that's been in existence, in existence since 2006. Um, that's the one with, you know, thousands and thousands of members, hundreds of thousands of posts there. And what that is, is that we call it an African social education network. So it's not a social network where you're going to hear what Beyonce did to Jay-Z and <laughs> it's all exclusively about black liberation so every meme that you post it has to be relevant to black liberation every quote everything you so that's the only topic so what i want to know is i mean what inspired you to uh you know leave the west so to speak and uh, come back home um really i have to trace it at least back to uh several generations so my great grandfather on my uh, father's side, my father's mother's father, was a member of the UNIA, uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association and ACL, African uh, Communities Imperial League. And with that, um, you know, oftentimes when people think of Nana Marcus Garvey, they think of, you know, back to Africa and, you know, this whole vision. So my great grandfather, that's uh, Nana Farrar Livalur, uh, he was part of that. So he I left Barbados, he went up to New York and he joined the Brooklyn chapter. And, you know, from there he rose to uh, one being the person who transcribed non Marcus Garvey's speeches that appeared wow. in the world newspaper. Then he uh, became the Auditor General of the UNIA and he received the Knights Commander of uh, African Redemption, the Cross of African Redemption which was, you know, the highest honor, one of the highest honors there in the UNIA. So um, you know, that's on my um, father's side, on my mother's side. She started coming to Ghana in 1972. Um, mm -hmm. she, saw an ad, she saw an ad in a newspaper about Nana Dini Zulu, and he had chartered a flight, and that flight was uh, coming here to, you know, Ghana specifically. So with that, you know, she was like, okay, I don't know where it's going, but I'm going. <laughs> so <laughs> I joined that charter flight. And, um, you know, she's been coming ever since. Now, after that, in the 1990s, she got her PhD in psychology. So wow. after that, she um, realized, like in so many others in terms of african Center psychology, that you can't really practice uh, psychology, you know, as a fragment. It has to be part of a holistic healing system which is yeah. on the African continent. So if somebody has a stomach ache, you know, the uh, Okom Four may ask, um, you know, how's your relationship with your wife? You're like, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, maybe because you're not on good terms with your wife, she's not cooking for you, and that's why you have an ulcer in this. So it's not just take this pill and call me in the morning, you know, later for you. It's let's find out what the social context is. Let's find out what the background is. You know, the mm. holistic healing. 
And really, you know, that's the spirit behind African Center Psychology. So she became initiated into the Akan tradition. Um, so she she's in Okomfo now. Um, so, you know, just basically to round it up, on both sides, my family has been about Africa, my mother's side, my father's side. My mother brought me here to Ghana in 1998 as part of the Sankofa journey, which we now do together. And as you can see, that had a major you know, impact on the trajectory of my life because at that time, you know, I'm what, 19, 18, 19 years old. It's like, oh, you know, whatever. But she yeah. me, had a major impact on me, which I didn't even realize at the time until maybe about a few months after that. Where I went through a very serious change, a life change, and all that my parents had instilled in me in terms of a foundation that started to come back up. Um, mm -hmm. That's where I started learning African languages, she specifically, because I became her Achiame, which is the spokesperson. I said, well, in order to do that, I must learn the language. Um, yeah. I'm very big on content over just surface, you know, looks and stuff like that. So I said, I'm going to learn this language thoroughly. And my idea was I wanted to learn it well enough to be able to teach the Chi language to native speakers. And that's what I'm here doing at the University of Ghana. We have UGRC, um, which is the University of Ghana required courses where I teach Chi to Ghanaians. Um, now, the rules are that you're not supposed to already be a native speaker of Chi if you're in the classes, you know, geared towards other Ghanaians who don't already speak Chi. But it ends up with like a good 60%. <laughs> oh, yeah, let me because I already know a language, let me try to get through. But what's ironic about that is that those end up, especially when it comes to the written portion, who end up having the most challenges because they know how to speak it. And now they just try to write it like how it sounds to their ears. And it's not like that. There's a standard orthography. You have to actually write it correctly. And there was a system wow. perfectly ahead of time. But now when it came to her final exam, it looked like her paper was bleeding on itself because all the red marks on it, all the red marks, I was like, no, you can't just write it. Yeah. But yeah, just saying all that to say, so I started learning the Chi language. In uh, 1999, I came back again for another two weeks with my mother as part of Sankofa Journey. And uh, your viewers can check that out, sankofajourney.com, S-A-N-K-O-F-A, and then Journey. Sankofa. Right, Sankofa. So the pronunciation. Sankofa. Am I saying it wrong? Sankofa, because our cameraman, his surname is Sankofa. Right. So yeah, Macconnell Sankofa. Right. So the ko is an o, so it's written with an open o, so it's an o sound instead of ko. Oh. Sankofa. But most people who Sankofa. just see it written, they just pronounce it like that, but Sankofa. And if you listen to um, the Devon drummer in the movie, Sankofa, he's actually pronouncing it correctly, of course. He says, Sankofa, oh, Sankofa, if you listen to him. He's not saying Sankofa, oh, Sankofa. <laughs> right? So not an O yeah. and an O sound, Sankofa, oh. But th that'll be... Sankofa, oh, Sankofa. <laughs> So you can uh, listen to that, you know, as well. Yeah, so in 1999, I came again as part of the Sankofa journey. Uh, my mother uh, brought me. And then by 2000, she was elected president of the uh, International uh, Association of Black Psychologists. And they wow. had their conference here in Ghana. And as that, she led a group of 500 psychologists here to Ghana for their uh, annual convention. And... What my plan was, because at that time I was an undergrad uh, going into my junior year, that I decided that what I was going to do was at the end of the conference, I'm going to stay on and I'm going to do an academic year here at the University of Ghana. So that's exactly what I did. I did study abroad. And um, because I had already uh, gotten a degree of uh, conversationality, let me say, and you know, fluency in the Akan language, Asante Chi specifically, that I didn't have to take the classes that all the other study abroad students took. So I'll sit in one on one with Opena Jikum, who's like this luminary uh, master of the Asante Chi language. So we were just sitting one on one, going through our Nazi stories and everything else. And then from there, um, the next semester, I was taking courses with all native speakers, people who've been speaking mm -hmm. their whole life. Uh, literature, we were going over poetry in the language, uh, prose, novels, you know, you name it, everything in the language, writing essays. And 
Uh, the end product of that is I wrote the longest essay I'd written in any language, but it was entirely in Chi on um, Proverbs wow. and in social context. It was 41 pages. So I was like, yeah, we're, we're getting there, right? <laughs> now, interestingly, when I What was the essay to, about? It was about Proverbs, Akan Proverbs in various social contexts. So in the context of songs, in the context of drum texts, all these other things. So um, yeah, it was, that was my major thing. So at that point in time, you couldn't get one sentence out of me without it being a proverb because I was just in love with African proverbs. It felt like a cheat sheet on life. It tells you what to do. It's like, yeah, I know how to handle that situation. Yeah. Um, so, you know, from there, when I went back to the United States, um, so I call it United States, but um, I had a teacher of Medunecha, what they refer to as ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. And yeah, yeah. Um, I had taken the course before, he had a study group before, and then I signed up for the course once I got back. So once I got back, I was always making all these connections. He'd be like, this is a ka. I'd be like, oh, that's like the kra. He would say, this is this. So like whatever the word is in Medunetra, I would always uh, see that parallel in P. So he yeah. decided, he told me, all right, so you're going to go to grad school for this? And I was like, well, I don't really know if I'm going to go to, he said, you're going. I said, okay, my bad, all right. <laughs> Which was very interesting because Atlanta is very black, but the only PhD program in African languages and literature was at Madison, Wisconsin, which is very white. So you want to talk oh. about and be on a bus and go all the way around campus and not see another black person? If you ever see a black couple, you have to take a photograph because you won't see another one. <laughs> So that was the situation at Wisconsin. So I went there. I, I ended up picking up two master's degrees, a master's degree Excellent. in literature and another one in linguistics. Um, but I decided to go to Chicago. And it was very interesting um, that I ended up getting blocked by uh, my former uh, supervisor. Now, mind you, she was always having me do uh, recordings about how great my Yoruba uh, learning experience was there. I became a teacher's assistant there at uh, Madison. Yeah. So I taught intro Yoruba and intermediate Yoruba. Um, but we Yoruba as well. Yoruba. Yeah, so that's that was the language that I studied in grad school. So I ended up becoming a teacher of Yoruba. And it was interesting. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. So I came to that program not knowing any Yoruba at all, except for I knew Bawani, but I didn't even know what the response was. So, you know, I came there to visit ahead of the school year um, that summer. And she said, okay, well, they have a program called Summer Cooperative African Language Institute, which is like, I think it was like six weeks or something. And she said, well, they advertise it as something that gets you the equivalent of an entire year of language learning. But she said, but no one can learn a year of the language in just six weeks. That's ridiculous, you know. So, you know, she was basically like, yeah, so and the reason why I had to do that is because that year I was coming in, they were only teaching intermediate. They weren't teaching intro. So I had to get up to intermediate level before the program started. And she was like, wow. yeah, nobody can do that. I'm sitting there like she has no idea who she's talking to. So, I'm like, I'm sitting there, I'm calling, right? so by the time I come back, they do what's called an OPI, oral proficiency interview. And by the end of the OPI, she was saying, you know what, we need you to uh, assist other students in teaching Yoruba. And then, you know, by the end of that year, I became officially a paid teacher's assistant teaching intro and intermediate. And, you know, the rest is history. At the same time, I was learning Wolof. And I started studying that informally with a brother who was from Senegal. Now, my inspiration for that was because one day at a, a grocery store, there was a, a checkout cashier who was from Senegal. And he looked at my father and he was like, you look just like one of my elders. You look exactly like the elders in my village. You look exactly, he, look, he must have said this 10 times. So I said, well, I guess I better learn some Wolof too. So there was a brother who was in the program. So this is African language and literature. He was on the literature side. I was on the linguistic side. And um, he spoke Wolof. So I said, you know what? We're going to have a deal. We are never going to speak to each other in anything but Wolof. So, you know, that puts a lot of responsibility on me because I'm the one who has to, you know, catch up. You have to speak um, it. And it wasn't until, like, I think a year or two after I met him that I first heard him speak 
English. We were like in a conversation with me and him, and then somebody walked up. I was like, you know what? I don't think I ever heard you speak English because, you know, that was our deal. We would meet up. I would be uh, like going to wall up dictionaries and recordings and whatever. So every time I come to like the cafe we were talking, he's like, who's teaching you? Who's teaching? I'm like, you're teaching me. But I would always bring like some new stuff that he knew he didn't tell me. So he's like, oh. <laughs> he said, yo, yo, some jungle kanga. He was like, wow, okay, great, great. Um, and then I also took that formally at one of those summer cooperative African language institutes. Then I also started studying Kikongo. So I decided I'm going to learn both. I'm going to stay in my one-off class, but I'm also going to take Kikongo class. Um, yeah. So that was amazing because what I decided to do is to take my Kikongo notes into Wolof. So like as I'm writing my notes, rather than like taking notes in English, I'm writing in Wolof. And there were like so many parallels. One, because Wolof still has more vestiges of the noun class system that you find more fully in Bantu languages. But then also you'll find words that are the exact same. So I found Wolof in Kikongo to be more closely related just you know at least on wow. the then either of the two were to like Akan and Yoruba which I found you know in between where those are located so like for example the word Ndongo which is student in Wolof and then Ndongo Kolo which is student in, in Kikongo so you find like all these different types of parallels and uh, so Kikongo Kikongo is is the language of which country uh, several countries it's the old Congo Empire which spanned mm -hmm. Angola, that's Mbanza, Congo there, um, modern day Congo DRC. So all the Congos get their name from the Congo Empire. Mm -hmm. So Congo DRC, um, Congo Brazzaville, and then also Gabon, and then expanding out, you know, from there. But those are the main four, you know, countries where you'll find it. So, you know, that was an amazing experience as well. Uh, you know, he's passed on since then. Uh, that's uh, Nkulu Fukiao. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I won't, yeah. <laughs> but it was, you know, an amazing experience. Uh, like, we take him out um, just shopping and all types of stuff. So it's like, for some of us, like, when we meet these authors, it's like meeting a superstar, right? But he's just like so down to earth. He's just cracking jokes and all types of stuff. But, you know, that was just a great experience. Um, now, before all of that, when I was an undergrad, I was also studying Kiswahili. So I took a semester of Kiswahili uh, ahead of this. So these are the main, I've just covered the main languages that I work in and or teach around. Um, wow. In Washington. Um, but then I can do small in like a, a hundred other languages like at least greetings and thank you and all those, but I don't really count those. A hundred languages. Yeah, at least. At least if I wow. Can, I'll, 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 I'll mean, have good morning or thank you or excuse me and like uncountable. That may be hyperbole, but like if I actually count them, I may sit down one day and just count <laughs> all the ones I can do small. In. Um, but also because from undergrad, I was studying capoeira mm -hmm. That also led me to learn Portuguese. So I've been to Brazil um, and I can sing like a good 200 songs in uh, Portuguese capoeira songs, of course. Um, wow. And then I also took French for some time, but mainly when I'm counting languages, I only count the African ones. So yeah. Well, that's, that's phenomenal. I mean, and that's a really full answer to um, what well, I was about oh, to say. But, to but then to come here, I decided to do my PhD here at University of Ghana. I finished that PhD. Okay. I got the Vice Chancellor's Award for the best PhD thesis um, wow. on Asante tree, Equipim tree, and Fanti, and how a specific type of verb is made into a noun in those three dialects of Akan. Um, after that, I did a paper on uh, African language teaching and I got the provost award for the best publication in the humanities from that and then recently I got the Nana Marcus Amboza Garvey Foundation Award for excellence in African studies and education so we're doing well. wow congratulations that is amazing Appreciate that's it. phenomenal that is yeah and you know what well, I must say well deserved because you know, um, just just having watched you on on Mo Demire's interview, I was just you know, 
I was just to totally like bowled over by your accomplishments. I just thought, mm -hmm. wow. And the thing is, it's an inspiration to so many of us who sometimes doubt ourselves and our own abilities uh, in terms of what we can achieve. When we listen to people like you, it then makes it easier because mm -hmm. you show us that it's doable, but you look like us, you know? You, you, you look like us, you're, you're grounded in Africa. I mean, okay, that rolls me into my next question um, mm -hmm. about life uh, for you um, in Ghana. I was wondering if you could describe for us, I mean, obviously, uh, you've come from UK, sorry, I know said UK, KK, mm -hmm. <laughs> USA. <laughs> no, um, with yeah. the UKs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, to to United Snakes to to uh, um, um, Ghana. When, when did you actually begin living there, and what's your journey been like since you've obviously been been living there? What what, what give me some of the highlights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I repatriated in two thousand eight with my wife, and at that time, uh, my daughter who was like nine months old at that time, like eight, eight or nine months old. I think, yeah, eight months at that point in time. Um, and she and my daughter stayed for about a month and they went back to the United Snakes. I stayed, you know, of course, cause I'm like, I'm not going back to the United Snakes. Um, and then they came again uh, permanently uh, two years after that. So yeah, tell so, me some of the highlights of your journey. Yeah, I'll, um, before I do that, I just wanted to go through various African languages that spell Africa with a K. So if you look at the Yoruba language, for example, Africa is spelled with a K, high tone, high tone, low tone. In a Khan language spoken in Ghana, and then also Cote d'Ivoire, Africa with a K. Kiswahili, Africa with a K. And Isi Zulu spoken in South Africa, Iafrika with a K. In Kikongo, Afelika with a K. In Hausa, Afirka with a K. In Kirundi, spoken in Burundi, Bufurika, in Kikuyu, spoken in Kenya, Abrika with a K, and Ibo, Africa with a K, in Luganda, spoken in Uganda, of course, Afrika, in Lingala, Africa with a K, in Malagasy, Africa with a K, in Sesutul, uh, Saleboa, Africa with a K, in Oromo, spoken in Ethiopia, Africa with a K, Fufulde, wow. Afrik with a K, uh, Setswana, Africa with a K, and Chivenda spoken in South Africa, also called Umzanti, uh, Afurika with a K, and Chisonga, Africa with a K, Siswati, Africa with a K, and Somalia wow. spoken in Somalia, Africa with a K, in King Rwanda, Afurika with a K. So I think you're getting the pattern. So, you know, uh, I'm hearing, you, listen, I, I can see now, yeah, I can see now. So, what I can't see is where's the C come from? <laughs> Very good. So when you look at um, Latin, you'll find that um, Latin, they'll write the C with that K sound, right? So when they want yeah. to express the K sound, they'll uh, spell it with a C. And this is also how Africa comes into the English language, because you have various theories about the etymology of the word Africa. So one theory is that, okay, it's coming from Ifriqiya, which is a Berber ethnic group. So they say, oh, from Ifriqiya, it became Africa. Others say it comes from Aprique or Afrique, uh, from either Greek or Phoenician, meaning uh, without uh, cold or sunny. Uh, other people say it comes from Ifran, uh, which are caves that are found there uh, in the desert regions in North Africa. You have others who say, okay, well, maybe it's coming from Leo Africanus, but that one doesn't make very much sense because when you say Leo Africanus, you're saying the lion of Africa. That presupposes that there's something called Africa before you can say that someone is a lion of Africa. So yeah, exactly. Leo Africanus, but then that's saying one who is victorious over Africa. So that pre again presupposes that there has to be something called Africa before you can say you're victorious over Africa. But what we know is that it comes into the English language because after the Second Punic Wars, you had uh, Rome mm -hmm. defeated Kartata and um, Nana Hannibal. So they decided to name their province Africa, right? So it comes into the English language based on the name that the Romans gave to their uh, province in North Africa, which they just call Africa. And this is a process in linguistics called pas pro toto, which is the part now becomes uh, in the place of the whole, because the Romans didn't know where 
that province ended per se, so they just referred to all the rest of that land further south to what they know as all of that is by extension Africa as well. Uh, it's also called Senegdo. Now, what we, and this is even why when I use the term Africa uh, or Africans, I'll write African equals black people, because when we use terms that are wholly indigenous, like Kemet, for example, this means land of black people, and we call ourselves Kemet, which is black people, right? So what that does is it associates who we are and then also this land, because when people say Africa to this day, you have all types of Arabs and Dutch Boers and all types of invaders who are like, look, I'm born on the African continent, so look, I'm African. But you can't do that when you're using the indigenous term like Kemet, because it means land of black people. And as soon as you say Kemet's you, you know these are black people, right? So, you know, what we do is that just because the English language is so limited, we'll write Africa with a K and then put an equal sign, means black people or land of black people. But, you know, ultimately, we really have to reclaim our own languages because otherwise we'll be uh, going back and forth of whether we should call ourselves Africans, whether we should call ourselves black people. That's not even an issue when we're speaking our own languages because it's one and the same. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. I didn't realize that uh, so many countries actually spell Africa with a K. So and I'm sure a lot of us don't. So I think now we'll all be changing the way in which we spell Africa. Um, yeah. That means I have to go into the description of a lot of my, um, a lot of, but it's an education at the end of the day, it's an education, everything I do every day I learn and I'm glad to learn, I'm, I'm always willing, I drink up knowledge like, you know, water, so I'm glad to have the knowledge because then not only, you know, do we have it, but it's about sharing it, it's about knowing that knowledge and sharing it, so I'm glad that we, you know, will be joining your platform to share this interview and also, you know, a lot of other content um, that we have and, and will be doing as well, because I think, um, I mean, at the moment, I've just seen so many kind of stories and seen so many things that have got us quite down, you know, um, affected us, I think. And so I think we need to have the identity uh, and that association with the motherland and know that it's Kemet. So that we can say, you know, we come from the land of the black people, actually. So, no, it doesn't apply to you. It's, you know, you've got to be commission. So I think that's quite important. Very good. And what I just put into the chat was, is a list of those various languages that I mentioned. And, um, you know, by and large, African languages do not use a C for the hard K sound. So like even in Wolof, which does use a C, it's not for a K sound, it's for a ch. So, ch. Yes. Right? Um, and yeah. then also because of that, back in the 1960s, you had people who started to uh, use Africa with a K in solidarity. So at that point in time, most people were like, based on Kiswahili, but it goes beyond just Kiswahili. So you have uh, people like Baba Laila O Africa, who spelled it with a K, Republic of New Africa, Africa uh -huh. Union, African Center Education, African Center of Psychology. New African prison struggle, like all of these different organizations and groups, and people were spelling Africa with a K in solidarity. And you know, that's yeah. the thing that we do to this day. That, that that was that's really interesting. I must confess, I was like, wow. You know, it's it's a learning journey, like I said, for, for all of us. And um, like I was asking before, if you could just give me some highlights of your, your journey. I mean, the fact is that. You know, you now live in, in Ghana permanently, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. so it's like us. We kind of uprooted, we left, and we said that, you know, enough is enough, really. But what was the catalyst for you? Right. Yeah, I actually had a situation when I was in Chicago uh, where, you know, I was part of... That's it. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was part of the Black Survival Network, also known as the Outdoor Leadership Skills Project. And one of the things mm -hmm. that we would do is that we would take youth from, you know, quote unquote, inner city and take them out to um, rural Illinois, where they would learn, or we would teach them everything from shelter construction, um, wild food foraging, fire making, um, just all these different outdoor skills. Now, when we are at the campsite, what we would always do is that we are the ones who have to defend the campsite. 
either from wild animals or uh, those on four legs or the wild animals on two legs. You know who we're talking yeah. about. So, you know, we are always armed. Now, coming from the campsite, um, I still had my firearm on me, and it was in my trunk, and it was in a bag there in my trunk. Now, at that time, Chicago had very draconian laws, which have since been stricken by the Supreme Court as being unconstitutional uh, against, you know, having firearms. Now, in the run-up to this, I'm also, you know, engaged to my now wife, and we were going out to discuss um, you know, how we're going to do everything in terms of the wedding ceremony and so forth. But I still had this uh, firearm in my trunk at that point in time. So about a week, before, no, it was probably about two or three weeks before that, as I'm coming out of the parking lot, now all this leads to somewhere, so just bear with me. I was coming out of the parking lot, a woman in a Lexus was eating some chicken, she was looking down, and she slammed into my front left turn signal. So now the turn signal isn't working. Now, fast forward, the insurance check comes on a Friday. This is happening on, I think it was like this Monday. So no chance to cash the check, but I, I'm finally now able to uh, fix the thing. Now, me and my fiance at that point in time are uh, on the south side of Chicago. I make a left-hand turn, and there's a cop car in front of me. Now, of course, my turn signal isn't working, but I've, tur I've clicked the turn signal, but they're not seeing the turn signal. So they decide to follow after me. When they follow after me, they pull me over, and with no probable cause, they decide to do what in Chicago they call a fishing trip, which is like, you know, if you ain't got nothing, we'll plant something, but we're just going to oh. keep looking until we find something. So, you know, they're looking through, they're looking through, there's nothing, there's nothing, uh, and they have me and my uh, pregnant fiance in the back of the police car. And that's when it dawns on me that the firearm is still in the trunk. But I'm like, it's, it's not a big deal because it's in the trunk. It's in a bag. It's not like it's in the cabin or loaded or anything. So I'm like, you know, we'll just deal with this. But they decide, no, they're going to put my wife, put my fiance at that point in time out on the side of the street and then take me to the precinct. And they're going to lie and say that it wasn't in the trunk. They say it's underneath the seat and it's loaded so that they can get a felony charge on this. On what otherwise oh, would have been at first a misdemeanor, now they're going to kick this up to a felony by lying. Mm -hmm. So my father comes there to Chicago, and he says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go back to where it happened. So we go there, and there's a brother who's sitting there. He's like, oh, yeah, I remember you. I remember you. They, they pulled you out, and they pulled the gun out of the trunk, and so forth and so on. And my father's like, how do you remember him? He says, who dresses like this on the south side of Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> Very fortunate that I have my African gear on ever since I was 19. I said, every day of my life, I'm going to wear clothes made by African people. And that Me was too. a response to Nana John Henry Clark. He gave a talk where he said, a people who can't make their own draws can't run no nation. So since that point in time, the golden standard was to have your own draws and yeah. be an exclusive for your yes, people, even my draws this is my kente draws oh uh, nice that's that's how we rock it now you get some extra views from that but you may have to you know yeah baby <laughs> so I'm, I'm wearing my african clothes there on the south side of chicago and that's how he recognized me he remembered everything so we put him as a key witness we finally go to where the car was impounded. We take photographs. Now, also, I'm a, I'm a teacher, so I have a whiteboard that covers the entire back of the seat. They didn't have a flashlight, so they're saying that they saw it underneath the driver's seat, but there's a whiteboard across the entire seat that you can't even see to where they're supposed to be seeing this thing. It's at night, so they're saying they see a tiny crack like this, literally like this, and they saw a, a loaded gun underneath it without a flashlight. And this is code in the Chicago area. Anytime they say, anytime they mean we're going to railroad this brother, they say, oh, it's under the seat. Wink, wink, wink. And the judge knows. Okay, um, I got you. Right? So anyway, long story short, it's completely false that once they took me to the precinct, they dump out. So I've always, I've had this bag for um, at least a good 20 years. Right? Wow. On it. Right. Now, I was wearing it that, that evening, 
so they dumped my bag out onto the table and they're looking through it and they asked me do you have any baggies i literally have no idea what they're talking about what do you mean what's that so they're there you know looking for whatever they're looking for of course i have no baggies. Yeah, yeah. so they look through okay there's nothing here it's just you know stuff so they put it all back into um you know this bag here and about a couple minutes after that they're asking me okay uh do you see it no where is it where is it i don't know where it is where is it where is it and i'm like what are they talking about they go out they come back in where is it i don't know where it is and um the next morning i got bailed out by the brothers who are part of the outdoor leadership skills project you know where we do all this good work for the youth and they said hey they lied they said that it was under the sea and i'm like what are you kidding me and it made sense because there were some other cops that went back into the system they changed things around in front of me while they have the state's attorney on the phone who's giving them instructions to do this so you know anyway with that once i get back to the house i'm looking through my stuff to see if anything is missing and i see a police car key a police squad car key i'm like this is odd <laughs> now what I do is I, I immediately uh, tell my lawyer that, you know, this is what we found. He said, don't worry, we can use this. So in the preliminary hearings, they dismissed it. They left their keys in the car. They left the key in my bag. As they were searching through oh. the bag, this is how incompetent bunglers they are. As they were searching through my bag, they put their own key back in with the rest <laughs> of my stuff. <laughs> incompetent bunglers they are. So... I have this, so the lawyer says, don't worry, we'll, we'll deal with that. So the preliminary hearings, they just throw it out, they throw it out, because um, interestingly, the police officers who made the arrest, they decide that they don't want to deal with this case, so they don't even show up, right? There's a movie called The Spook Who Sat By The Door, and there's a brother who's very light-skinned and who says, I was born black, I live black, I'm gonna die probably because I'm black. So he has this, you know, very poignant scene. That brother ended up being a detective on the police force. He also was one of the brothers who we would always go to the range with as we're practicing, you know, for the outdoor leadership skills project. So we were on very good terms and he's a higher up detective and the ones who arrested me are rookies. But anyway, long story short, they, these rookies decided they don't want to, you know, testify or whatever. So they just throw the, the case out. But because the state's attorney is the one who cooked up all this stuff to go from misdemeanor to felony, he's like, no, nah, this is my felony charge. But he calls it back up. So now we have to fight this thing uh, on a motion to quash because it's an illegal search, illegal arrest, and it's fraud in terms of how they even got the firearm in the first place. So at one of these hearings, my lawyer uh, at the somewhere close to the close of the hearing, he says, because the police are saying that they never even went into the boot. They say they never went into the trunk of the car. So my lawyer says, if you didn't ever go into the trunk of the car, which is a lie, because that's where they got it from. He said, if you never went into the trunk of the car, then where did we get this from? Right? The police uh, they're like, oh, oh my goodness. Oh. So they're all discombobulated. They don't know what to say. Isn't this a police car key? Yes, it is. Then how did you, how did we get it if you never went into the trunk? Okay, fine. So now they're all thrown off on what's a diversion because that's not what our case is built on. But they're now trying to explain this away. So the next hearing, they're coming with if we, it must have been at the precinct that the car key was lost because that's the car key that we used to drive. With. But it's not about the car key, it's about the brother, who, the witness, the eyewitness who we went back to see. So we call up the eyewitness, and this is just a down to earth brother. He's like, Yeah, I was there, I saw him wearing all them African clothes. He's just so believable because he's just so real, right? Yeah. And the uh, prosecution is like, so, okay, you're saying it was in the trunk. So when they pulled it out of the trunk, did they wave it in the air and say, look, we got it? Or what did they do? He's like, what do you think? This is a movie? No, they just took it. And they put it on it. So he just lays out everything exactly, <laughs> as, it exactly as it happened. And, you know, by the end, this old white judge who looked like he was probably at a lynching somewhere because all these cases, they send it out of Chicago to a place called Bridgeview, which at that point in time had a 99.9999% 
conviction rate of black people because if they don't get you straight up, they'll get you to cop a plea. But we're like, we're not copping no plea because this is fraud, right? And we're standing against this fraud. So long story short, even the this white, uh, you know, lynch mob looking judge, he's like, I can't believe the police's story. It's obvious that me that and my witness that we're telling the truth and that the police are lying. And you know they're lying. As soon as they say they saw it underneath the uh, car seat, that's how everyone knows this is a lie. We're just going to railroad this brother. So as I was sitting on the witness stand, I was saying that I said to myself that never again will I allow myself to be in the jurisdiction of these folks where on a whim they can decide I'm not going to see my family for the next 10 years, right? Yeah, exactly. On a whim, right? A fishing trip, yeah. as they call it. So... I said within a year I'm going to repatriate to Africa. So that's the midway because I was at uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and I was teaching at uh, Chicago for about three years, and then I repatriated to Ghana and haven't looked back since. Mm -hmm. So that's the short version of how <laughs> I decided to. There's always there's always a uh, um, something that pushes you because like with me it was racist incidents with my children and, you know, then trying to push it through the legal system and then realizing that even the legal system, you know, not that I'm surprised at all because I wasn't. I know how institutional racism works. Um, but seeing just how colluded and corrupt they were just made the situation like 1 million percent worse for me. You know, literally having them say, oh, we didn't receive your court documents. What are you talking about? A Senate recorded delivery. You know, I have a receipt here and you sign for it and this is the person's name. But, you know, constantly, constantly, constantly having to push. You know, you put all your documents in and then they're finding like little tiny things and say, oh, uh, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Hang on. But yes, I did. And, and there it is, actually. Oh, well, we didn't realize. So we've sent it back. You know, like. You know, if you can't do your job, don't be there doing it. But it wasn't that. It was just to obstruct you. And I think what happens is a lot in the West, as I call it, is that what they do is they do anything to frustrate you. And so they draw out the process. And they know that in that, in that while they're doing that, it's causing you more mental um, distress. And so it's all intentional. We suffer from post-traumatic slave disorder and, and post-traumatic slave syndrome, as described by uh, Dr. Uh, Joy DeGroy. And, you know, Frances Chris Welsing, she also outlined uh, the paradigm as well for, for racism in terms of the power structure that exists. And it's there. And so I'm, like, trying to get all my brothers and sisters to say, look, I'm not, like, the most, if you like, worldly, um, if you like, educated person so far as... Um, our African roots are concerned. I was brought up, you know, in a very pan-African family, especially with my dad, but that doesn't make me an expert. And you don't have to be to come home. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you just got to have a love of Africa and love of the people and a love of yourself. Because if you love yourself, you want to be in the best place possible for you. I just feel that um, being here is the best thing I ever done is the best move I ever made um, for myself and my family. And I, I've never been so happy, you know, in terms of my general day-to-day -day life experience. And um, I don't know, I don't know, but, but how do you feel like on a day-to-day -day basis and, and what are some of the highlights of your experience? Right. Now, just on the point that you made, and I'm familiar with, uh, Mama and Dr. Joy DeGruy, uh, Leary's work. And um, I remember looking at her work, and I, I, I wrote an article on, um, they have this UNESCO project um, dealing with what they call legacies and impact of slavery on the diaspora. And in the article, I, I was writing that you can't talk about a legacy of something that's still ongoing. And that yeah. was my issue also with the term post. <laughs> they post, it means that, you know, it's after, right? So when you look at the work of, uh, for example, um, Michelle Alexander, she deals with how there are more Black people enslaved now to the prison industrial complex than were enslaved in 1865. And in that article, this was an article came out back in, I want to say 2015, thereabout. 
um, it was basically dealing with that same thing, the 13th Amendment. According to the 13th Amendment, it says that uh, slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United uh, States. Well, let me say United States. Uh, I'll actually read it says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Now, when they say this, they were very clear of why they put that caveat in where it says, except as punishment for a crime, because immediately after that, they have the convict leasing system. Then after that, they have uh, debt p and and then sharecropping, and now the prison industrial complex. So they were very mm. clear that they're phrasing it in that way with such a yeah. caveat so that they could come up with things like uh, the pig law felony, that if you, uh, steal a farm animal and not that you actually do it all that has to happen is that a white person says that you suspects did. you and then once they say that you did you can't uh be a witness in your own trial because you're black and you can't bear a uh, witness against a white person and they have other laws like a black uh, farm worker can't walk along railroad tracks and they can't speak loudly in the presence of white women they can't sell produce after dark and they can't spit in public like just random stuff. They just like they looked out the window and said, "Okay, a black person is spinning. Okay, that's against the law. Uh, what else is against the law? Oh, he's standing. Okay, that's against the law." So you know, this is a major thing that we're dealing with. That once you understand what this is all about, you see the same thing with the three stripes. You know, a felony thing. Um, yeah, that's crazy. Disparity in sentencing, and like uh, Nana Amos Wilson says that laws don't protect anyone. It's all about who enforces the laws and who decides when to enforce them and on whom. So they'll see a white boy steal a car and say, oh, he's just joyriding. They'll see a black boy do the same thing, you know, same age. They'll be like, shoot him, blah, 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 blah. right? Yeah. So it's all about those who decide to enforce the law and how they decide to enforce it and on whom and in whose ultimate interest and to who, whose ultimate detri detriment. So, yeah, that's that's the thing about that. When I say when I hear people say post, I'm like, you got to say Neo. The same thing when people say post colonial. Say yeah, post I mean, I, you know, I stand corrected. Not post it's, it's, it's current. Neo enslavement, right? But yeah, in terms of some of the highlights, because that's the sidebar and I'm known for those uh, in terms of uh, highlights. Um, it's, it's along similar lines because I remember being at the Abri Botanical Gardens and I was holding my son in my arms. This is after Tamir Rice had been shot and it just dawned on me that I don't have to worry about him being shot because he has a toy gun, right? And that's something that you can't pay for. Like if the parents of Tamir Rice were able to say, you know what? If I could have my son for a billion dollars, they would say, double it. I'll give you two times that, right? That's something that you can't even imagine, you know, in terms of the worth, in terms of the value to you is the life of your own child. Um, another time, like I was driving, I was driving and I realized that, you know what? Something is weird. And I was like, what's so weird? Okay, I realized what's weird is that I'm not careening my neck every uh, 20 feet to see if the police are around or hiding behind the corner. Yeah. Like, it was just like, this is something, there's something weird. And it's, it was that. Or that there will be a police car. So here they don't give tickets in Ghana. There, there are no police cars that come behind you and give tickets. So one time there was a police car that was following behind me. It had, you know, lights flashing because it was just going to where it was going. And I realized that my heart didn't jump. <laughs> that there was no whatever that uh, fear, adrenaline, you know, dump was in the United States, that that was absolutely absent. And like, you don't even realize that you have it. You don't even realize how abnormal that is until you don't have it. And then you yeah. realize you don't have that, right? And there was another brother who I went to undergrad with who said that he was walking around the store one day and he said, that he realized that he's not being followed around because he's black. Because yeah. Everybody's black, <laughs> including the ones who own the store and everybody in the store is like, you know, to say we're going to follow you because you're black is like, well, you better double your staff. <laughs> and you all better have some staff to follow your own staff because all the staff is black. So it's like, what are you? Yeah. Doing? And he phrased it in a very interesting way. He said, this is what it must feel like to be a white person in the United States. 
Yeah, privilege. Just walking around. <laughs> like, just walking around. It's not somebody's following me. And I never said they follow us because we're black. I say they do that because they're white and that's how they behave ever since they crawled out of the caves and hills of Western Eurasia. Now, I also don't call uh, Europe a continent, nor do I recognize its existence, because if you look at a satellite map, you'll see that this is one landmass called Eurasia, and that's just westernmost Eurasia. To say Europe is a continent would be the equivalent of saying West Africa is a continent, because you can walk from West Africa to Central Africa the same way you could walk from Portugal all the way to easternmost Siberia, or you have it. But because they're the ones who make the language and make the rules, they decided that their little fragment of Eurasia is going to magically be a continent. And then they enforce that through terminology. They'll say, here's something called the European Union. And you say, oh, okay, I guess we gotta go along with that. But literally with your own eyes, you can see that the reality is that this fits no definition of what a continent is. It's just that we happen to be speaking their language and in their yes. language, they decide that their fragment of a continent is its own continent, just because they said so. Wow. So um, recently, obviously, there's been something in the media. I just want to discuss that with you really, really quickly. No um, um, uh, the brother, Botham John, he was um, shot while he was in his house. I mean, one of the things about living in Africa is that I don't have to worry about, you know, sitting in my house and someone coming in and shooting me. But um, this is a, a, a serious case in, in my in my view, that you can be sitting in your house and, you know, I don't care what she had to say. She must have known she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, she just shot him in cold blood, in my view. And this was an assassination in the same way that Joshua Brown, the, the um, witness, was an assassination. I saw the brother and the judge hugging this convicted felon, this murderer, Mm -hmm. Yeah, this white policewoman who had killed his brother. I was like, punk, punk, punk. I was like punching at my screen. And when I saw the judge, I was slapping at every... You know, uh, you know, metaphorically, of course. <laughs> um, I was just so ashamed. I was absolutely, you know, disgusted to see that uh, Africans... In America, what's going on in their heads? I don't feel like, you know, I'm, I'm obviously here in my home with my family right now. I don't feel like afraid to think that someone's going to bust in my door and shoot me dead because they happen to walk into the wrong house. Firstly, we live in compounds. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, in Africa, when you live in a compound, people talk about, oh, why have you got walls and a gate? The reason why is because you spend most of your life outside. And so when you're outside, I mean, we're outside drinking a tire, we're outside playing, we're outside playing music, we're outside cooking, we're outside eating. Everything is very outside, you know, here. And I love it. Mm. I absolutely love it. Mm. I can't describe to you how lovely it is. You know, you actually have a social life, a real one. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about, the case of um, Botham John. Botham John, you know, he was in his apartment doing his own mind, in his own business, doing his own thing. And somehow this cop ordered him to open his door. And then she went in because apparently the door was not open. And she went in and she, you know, killed him, shot him in cold blood, and then was seen pacing outside. She was filmed by Bunny, you know, who I respect 100% pacing outside, um, you know, of this apartment. And uh, rather than uh, administering the care that she should have been doing, not only that, it turned out in the trial that she'd also sent some very uh, uh, racially um, loaded messages. Um, you know, anyway, so in the trial, obviously, um, it's gone on. And this um, Amber, but this... Uh, this uh, cop, this, uh, you know, killer, this murderer, this convicted felon um, has, um, you know, been convicted of only 10 years, only 10 years, which is ridiculous. I think that is the most preposterous sentence I've ever heard of for murder. How ridiculous. 
And then, you know, I saw when the brother, the brother, honestly, I just went into like overdrive. I, when I saw him get up and hug, I was like punching like at the screen. Literally, I was so vexed. If that was my brother, I would have jumped him. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when, when, when Joshua Brown was on the stand, no one got, the man was crying tears. No one got up to comfort him though. The judge didn't get up to comfort him. In fact, the judge, is, the judge, the judge was heard saying, and it's recorded, saying, you know, what's he doing here? Mm -hmm. You know, so something's going wrong right there. But what hurts me is that Joshua Brown, as a result of these cuddles given by a judge, what's a judge? What's a judge doing, going and cuddling a convicted felon who killed a black man in cold blood? And then giving her a Bible. I mean, I'm sorry, but the insanity of the whole situation. And then the, the wickedness which, you know, has resulted in Joshua Brown being killed, being shot in his mouth and in his head and in his heart, in his mouth and in his heart, killed in cold blood. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and the thing is, what's this forgiveness? I don't even know. Is forgiveness even an African word? Like in Gambia here, it's like you have to make things right. There ain't nothing to do with forgiveness. You do something wrong, they want you to make it right. There's no like concept of forgiveness here from what I've experienced. Yeah. You got to remedy the situation. <laughs> That's it. When I, when I saw the sentence of 10 years, that, that was it for me. I'm like, I'm done. I have to call as many of my brothers and sisters home because there, there's no justice. You know, it's just this. That's all it is. And it's time for us to start to plan Someone was saying to me, oh, but Julie, you're talking about reparations. You know, we're never going to get reparations. And so I said, oh, no, I know people got reparations. They said to me, but how? What were you talking about? I said, they got reparations. They did it themselves. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean how? So I said, listen, I know someone, yeah, that planned. She planned it. She'd been living here for a long time now. And she planned it. Before she left, she made sure... She got as many credit cards, as many bank loans, and she chose the banks, the banks, especially the ones involved in slavery, and she set up loans from every single one of them. She did. She said she's getting her own reparation. When she told me her story, you know, she won't say it on camera, but I can repeat it. But when she told me her story, she like maxed about 90,000 pounds, yeah? so she could build her house and start her life she said she got a reparation and she said at the end of the day it's civil and they these banks are insured so when they take these loans or these credit cards and everything they're already insured so if you default they get the money back anyway so it, yeah she ain't stealing nothing she's taking back that's her reparation and it's like when i heard her story i was so inspired i said i wish you'd have told me that before i left <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. And there are, but, there are you know, those of us who want reparations in kind, which is to say the Nana Nat Turner types of reparations, the Nana Amani Rinas, stopping the Roman Empire on elephant back type of reparations, the Nana Nzinga in Angola type of reparations, the Nana Yasantiwa type of reparations. We want yeah. the real, real reparations. Which That's isn't, the real one. And pictures of dead white folks on it. We want the real reparations. So I'll leave that as a word to the wise in terms of, you know, actually what some of us are working on. You know, we want our own postcards. <laughs> I just want you to tell um, our Black Sit viewers uh, about some of the wonderful things about Ghana and about your life in Ghana and why they should come home. Very good. So one of the things that as I'm driving around, I say this is one of the things that you cannot pay for is that I can drive around all day and see nothing but black people. Beautiful, beautiful black people, right? Yeah. Another thing is that just the other day I was talking to somebody who was in Detroit and she was talking about I was getting cold and I was sitting there with my shirt off. I was like, oh, it's warm here. When I left Chicago, I said, never another Chicago winter. Never another Chicago winter. So whereas some folks are chilly and layering up, some of us are sipping coconut water under palm trees. Yeah. And, you know, 
I've, I've never lived in the UKKK, but I've passed through on my way to Africa and on my way coming from Africa. And every single time I've been, it's not like a whole, you know, gajillion times, but every single time I've passed through, it was cold, it was rainy, it was dreary, it was windy, it was overcast. And I was like, and this is where people are running to come to? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you joking? <laughs> this cold rock is what people are trying to get to? Black Shit family, I just want to thank you, you, you. Obadele Kawan, doctor. Yes. Uh, oh. Thank you so much um, just for your time, your energy. I've learned. This has like been a university lecture for me.